Today, we are covering acute kidney injury, also known as AKI. This is a sudden, serious loss of kidney function. Recognizing it early is the most important factor for effective management. So what is acute kidney injury? It's a rapid decline in the kidney's ability to function. The key here is that it's often reversible if we act fast. When kidney function drops, metabolic waste and fluid build up in the body. Here's our plan. We'll define acute kidney injury, review its causes, discuss diagnosis and staging, outline management principles, and finally cover prognosis and follow-up. Okay, let's get into the specifics. How is AKI diagnosed? The diagnosis requires meeting at least one of three distinct clinical criteria. The first criterion is a rise in serum creatinine of 0.3 milligrams per deciliter or more within a 48-hour window. The second is also based on serum creatinine. This one is an increase to 1.5 times the patient's baseline value or more happening over the previous seven days. And the third criterion is based on urine output. We're looking for a urine volume of less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for at least six hours. Now, how common is AKI? It's quite prevalent in hospitalized patients. About 7% of general admissions experience it. But look at the intensive care unit, or ICU. That number jumps to 30%. This really underscores how vulnerable critically ill patients are. To understand the why behind AKI, we classify its causes into three main groups, pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal. It all depends on where the problem starts. Pre-renal AKI is the most common type. The problem isn't with the kidney itself, but with reduced blood flow to the kidney. This can be due to things like hypovolemia, heart failure, or sepsis. Certain medications like NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors can also contribute. Next is intrinsic AKI. This is when there's direct damage to the kidney tissue. A classic example is acute tubular necrosis, or ATN, which can be brought on by prolonged ischemia or exposure to nephrotoxins. And finally, we have post-renal AKI. This is simply an obstruction somewhere in the urinary tract that stops urine from draining properly. Think kidney stones, an enlarged prostate, or tumors. So once you suspect AKI, the next steps are to confirm it and figure out its severity. For that, we use clinical evaluation and the KDGO criteria. One useful lab test for differentiating between pre-renal and intrinsic causes is the fractional excretion of sodium, or FENA. For pre-renal AKI, the FENA is usually less than 1%. For intrinsic AKI, it's typically greater than 2%. This table shows the KID-GEO staging criteria. KIDGO stands for Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. Stage 1 involves a smaller rise in creatinine or a shorter duration of low urine output. As you move to stages 2 and 3, the changes become more severe. And take note, any patient who needs renal replacement therapy is automatically considered stage 3. The staging system directly informs our management plan, which follows a stepwise approach. The management strategy has three main parts. First and foremost, identify and treat the root cause. At the same time, provide supportive care, like managing fluids and electrolytes. And for the most severe cases, the third step is to initiate renal replacement therapy. Renal replacement therapy, or RRT, isn't for everyone. It's indicated for specific, severe situations. These include severe fluid overload that doesn't respond to diuretics, a life-threatening electrolyte imbalance like hyperkalemia, uremic complications such as encephalopathy, or an AKI that just isn't getting better. So what about the long term? Let's talk about patient outcomes, prognosis, and the need for follow-up. You know, while AKI can often be reversed, it's a major hit to the kidneys. An episode of AKI is a significant risk factor for developing chronic kidney disease, or CKD, down the road. This is why long-term monitoring is so important. The effects of AKI on the body can lead to serious complications. We're talking about things like hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, and fluid overload. All of these contribute to increased morbidity and mortality. This really drives the point home. Close follow-up after an episode of AKI is essential. It's how we monitor the kidney's recovery and catch any potential slide into chronic kidney disease early on. So I'll leave you with this question to think about. Considering the criteria and risk factors we've just discussed, what is one practical change you could make to improve early recognition of acute kidney injury in your own practice?